Hey folks, welcome to Wolpins Gaming Den. Today we'll cover the tutorial for the game Council of Four, designed by Simon Luciani and Daniel Tashini, published by uh, Command Games and Cranio Creations. Uh, this is a, is a game designed for two to four players, expected to be played in roughly 40 to 70 minutes, largely based on the player count. Uh, and it, it is a Euro style game where basically you look to set out your merchants on the different locations on the board trying to trigger bonuses uh, which will hopefully score you points uh, during the game, uh, get you bonus styles uh, and then hopefully score you points at the end of the game as well. And of course uh, whoever has the most points at the end is basically the winner for the game itself. So let's start by looking at the setup and then we'll go into the different actions you can do on your turn, what the turn structure could look like and what the end game uh, scenario also looks like as well. So to start off, uh, the game comes with these two separate boards. This is the main game board. This is sort of like a sideboard that goes along with it. So you'll put both of these out uh, in the main play area uh, next to one another for ease. Uh, this game board for the command version is double sided. Uh, it doesn't matter which player count you're using, you can use both sides at all player counts and all difficulty levels. Uh, the general difference is how the locations are laid out. So it just gives you a little bit of variability with the uh, uh, multiple playthroughs uh, back to back. So just pick one side that you know you uh, want to try out for your first game and put that face up over here at the center. Uh, once you've done that, you will take these different city tiles that the game comes with. Uh, you will shuffle these up and randomly assign these to all of the different cities on the game area on the assigned space uh, to the left of the name of the city itself. Uh, the only one that will not have a token assigned is the one at the very center. As you can see, there is no space for a token over here. So that one will not have a token assigned, but all the other different city centers will. Uh, once you've done that, we will now look at the development tiles that the game comes with. Uh, all these different development tiles are basically of three different types and they can be separated out based on the artwork on the back itself. So you'll separate out the three different uh, categories of development tiles and give all of them a shuffle. They have their own dedicated space at the top of the board and you can identify them with the artwork printed over there uh, as that will correspond to this. Uh, I will also call out that the game board area itself is broken into three broader regions and you can make that out based on the color scheme uh, over here. So you can see a lot more green over here. Uh, I'm going to say brownish, yellowish kind of uh, hue over there and a little bit more gray over here. So these are the three different regions on the board and each of these development tiles correspond to one of the three different regions. So uh, pick out the appropriate one, uh, take all of them, shuffle them up. Uh, put it face down on the draw pile over here like so uh, and then draw the top two and put them up face up over here like that. You will do that for all the three different regions like so. Once you're done with that, you will now move on to putting out the different reward tiles that the game comes with and there's a few different types that the game comes with. So over here you have the four reward tiles for the four different colored cities. Uh, there's one for each color. You will basically put it out in the appropriate uh, a reward space over here. Then you have these orange bonus tiles uh, and these are basically numbered uh, starting from 25 going all the way down to 3. Uh, you will basically uh, make sure that these are uh, sequenced. So the highest will at go at the top then you have to, uh, 18 uh, and then going all the way down to the bottom. Uh, this will then be put on the top location over here like so. Uh, there are three more reward tiles, each one corresponding to the three different regions that we spoke about. Again, you can make out that the artwork will be in common for those regions. You will put it next to the development tile in their assigned space at these particular spots. Uh, once you're done with that, we now need to make sure that we seed this particular area over here where the different council members are basically going on. So we've already done the seeding, but let's have a look at how the seeding process works because it's meant to be random and there is a process uh, explained in the rule book. Uh, so you can follow that basically to make sure that it is done properly. The way that it's supposed to work is you're supposed to draw, you know, this is your entire uh, car deck of politics cards. You will have the deck thoroughly shuffled up. Uh, then you will start by drawing one card off the top over here and then that colored uh, uh, council member will basically start going in from the left over here. So because we've already seeded up, uh, it up, if we haven't, the first one we drew was green. 
So we would put out a green council member over here. Then we would basically draw the next one uh, and then put out that corresponding council member over here and then go all the way uh, across like so. Uh, if you draw a card where you're out of the council members, because there is sort of like a limited supply of these, uh, then you basically just ignore that and draw another card and put that out. And if you were to draw a Joker card, which basically looks something like this, which basically is sort of like a wild with all the different colors, you basically ignore this and again draw another one to determine which one goes out in these spots. So, and then once you're done doing all of that, you will take all the cards you've used uh, in the seeding process, put them back in the deck, shuffle it up, and put it as a draw pile next to the play area, like so. Uh, with that said, you're mostly done with the setup of the game area. Now you need to do the setup for the individual players. Uh, as I mentioned, the game comes with the, the game is meant to be played by up to four players. So uh, there are these different player mats that you will get based on different player colors. Uh, there's more of these in the game box itself. So in this case, we've picked out the gray one. So we're going to play with the gray colored pieces. Uh, you will put it in front of yourself. It acts as a very good reference sheet uh, to give you a reminder of the different actions you can do and whatnot. Each uh, player will then pick up the player pieces, the plastic pieces in their own respective colors. In this case, because I'm playing with gray, uh, I will get one large miniature. Each color will get one large miniature. Uh, this is mostly decorative. You're meant to put it on your play mat as a reminder to everybody else uh, as to which color you're basically playing. Then next, you will take all the remaining smaller pieces uh, in your corresponding color. There's gonna be 11 of these now. Uh, you will take 10 of them, put it in front of you. So this is going to be a general supply that you will then start putting out on the main game board itself. Uh, there is one that's going to be left over, the 11th piece. You will basically put that at zero on the points track. Uh, so it will be used to basically keep track of your points around the game board uh, on your turns. Uh, with that said, now you next need to determine who the start player is going to be. And because uh, there is some starting resources uh, that are different based on the start player. So in this case, let's assume that we're playing a three player game. So we've got these three different meeples for the starting players, uh, for the three different players put out over there. Uh, and now we need to determine who the start player is and assign resources accordingly. So let's say uh, uh, we've chosen randomly and Gray or myself, uh, I was the start player. Uh, we now need to put out our individual markers on this particular area. So the first marker that you will have will go on what's called a nobility track, and this is on this side, and everybody starts off at zero. So that's the same for everybody. Uh, next, this is the money track, and this is where you're gonna keep track of who has how much money over the course of the game. Uh, whenever you gain money, just basically move up the track. Whenever you're spending money, you basically move down the track. So that's how you're gonna keep track of it. Uh, whoever's the start player will put their token on 10. That is the amount of money the starting player starts off with, and they will get one servant to start off with. Every player in clockwise order will get one more money and one more servant. So whoever's the second player will get 11 money and they would get two servants. The third player gets 12 money and they would get three servants. And if we had a fourth player in this example, they would be set up with 13 money and four servants to basically start them off. With that, you would be done with the setup for the uh, different players. And one small step that I just quickly missed out uh, is the, the queen mini. Uh, there's a queen uh, figure in the game. Uh, it is unique and can be identified relatively easily. That one will always go and start off at the center location on the game board. So we've got this miniature started over here. And with that, the remaining council members that you would not be using uh, get put off to the side. Any other pieces that you're not using for now will get put off to the side. Uh, you will have a bunch of uh, other servant tokens, so you're basically going to have them saved separately uh, so that you can use them. The game also comes with servant tokens in denominations of three, uh, and it's easy to tell because you basically have images of three individuals printed on it. So remember, this is uh, equivalent to three servants, whereas something like this uh, is equivalent to one servant. And with that, you're done with the setup for the game. Uh, the one last thing you need to do uh, is assign the hand of uh, the starting hand to the individual players. Uh, you will go to the politics deck. Again, it's shuffled up from our setup, if you remember. Uh, you will deal out six cards to each player to form their starting hand. Uh, and this information is meant to be private. So, you know, once you get your cards, you're gonna uh, make sure that you keep it secret from everybody else. And, but of course you can look at it whenever you want uh, and you probably will over the course of the game. And you're done with the setup at that particular point. So in this game, basically you're looking to put out your individual merchants all over the board. 
uh, and you want to do that as strategically as possible to be able to trigger combos and achieve bonuses you will be looking to get those development tiles which will give you uh, bonuses by themselves but the development tiles are also what you need to be able to put out your merchants as well and these council members will determine the kind of cards you can play from your hand to be able to do that so uh, I know it may not make a lot of sense right now, but let's crack into the individual actions you can do on your turn and hopefully this will now make a little bit more sense. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the player mats that we're not uh, using over here in our display and we're basically going to use this as a reference to understand the rules for the turn structure of the game itself. So on your turn, you're basically going through two different steps. First step is draw a card. That's easy enough. So basically all you do is you go to the draw pile over here you will draw one card and add it to your hand so as we had said because you've dealt out six cards to everybody at the start uh, once you do this you will now have seven cards in your hand at the start of your very first turn uh, next thing that you will do is you can do one main action and you can do one bonus action or what the game calls a quick action and you can do them in any sequence you want so you can do the main action first and the quick action second the quick action first and the main action second it's completely your choice uh, and you can even skip the quick action if you want it's not mandatory but you must always do a main action and you should always be able to do a main action so that's always going to be there so let's start by looking at what the main actions are so that they start making a little bit more sense so the first one basically says you can add a council member discarding the from the left discarding the one to the right and that gets you four money so Let's say, for example, in this one, if we were not happy with this set of color combination, and we'll talk about why that may or may not be the case later on, but let's say maybe I wanted more uh, green in this particular set. So you can always add council members that are available in the general supply. You obviously cannot add one that's uh, maxed out. So let's say we took one of the green pieces for this particular area. And of course you can do this for this or this or this or even this one. So there are four different places where you can do this at. Uh, you will start by adding it from the left. You will push everything off to the right and the rightmost one basically goes back into the supply. So they will basically get added to the general supply uh, and they will be available for somebody else to put down in a future turn if they want to. Uh, and once you're done with that, you basically take four money so you basically add four money to your counter over here. So if I was doing this action, I would go from 10 to 14. And that would be the end of my main action over here. So again, you're adding a council member from the left, pushing everything to the right, and the rightmost one gets discarded uh, or puts back in the supply, and you get four money as a result of that. So that's easy enough. The next action that you can do, uh, potentially, is you can discard cards from your hand or spend cards from your hand, uh, however you want to call it, uh, to pick up a development tile. And that's where these council members become important. So let's say, for example, if on a future turn, I wanted to send out my merchants to these locations, one of the actions that I can do that with is by having a development tile with that corresponding city letter printed on it. So for example, this development tile has the letter D printed on it, and this will allow me to send out a merchant onto this city over here, which is D. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I may want to pick up a development tile from here. Uh, but for me to be able to do that, I would need to discard cards that match this set of colors over here. So if I wanted to do this without paying any penalty because of a mismatch or anything, I would need to discard two green cards, one gray card, and one yellow card. If I can discard those four specific cards, I can choose one of these two development tiles and take it in front of me, and this would come in face up. Uh, and there's always going to be some sort of a print benefit printed on it and this benefit you would get right away so in this case this represents a symbol for points uh, so this would come in front of us face up and i would get the three points right away if i were to do this action now it is also possible that i may not have the exact set of combination of cards to discard so i would also have other means of paying for that cost and uh your player map basically gives you a reference of that as well. So uh, if you look at this banner over at the bottom, this basically says if you're discarding four cards, exact cards that match up, so uh, two green, one gray, and one yellow, or uh, one blue, one yellow, one brown, one gray, you get the idea for these three, uh, you can put out that. But if you're short by one card, you can pay, you can sort of expend the three cards that do match with four money and do the same action. If you're short by two cards, you can spend two cards and seven money and still do that action. Or if you just have one card that matches, you can still spend 10 money in 
lieu of the three missing cards and still do that action on that turn. So money is a good way for you to sort of like uh, uh, substitute the cards that you're needed. Now, you can also choose not to spend that card, even if you have the card in your hand, uh, that is an option that you would have. Uh, so you make the strategic decision between, hey, do I want to spend the cards and do that or save it for something else, but rather spend the money at that point. That's that's your call. The other thing you can also do is, uh, as we had looked at this, the game also comes with these joker cards or wild cards, uh, and they have all the different colors in here. If you're ever spending a wild card uh, instead of any specific colored card, uh, it does substitute for that color. But remember that uh, you would need to pay uh, one coin penalty for using a wild card or rather each wild card uh, on your turn. So a wild is not a complete wild. It's basically like a wild with one coin that substitutes as any color you want. So that's basically this acts as a reminder uh, that tells you that. And that's basically this action over here. So you can uh, discard the appropriate number of cards with the appropriate uh, cost in coins from over there and you pick up the development tile, take it in front of you, gain this benefit immediately. Uh, some benefits are stronger, others are weaker uh, because it balances off with uh, what it, the flexibility it allows you to do. And we'll come into that later on and then that's basically your action right there. The next action that you can do is you can turn in one of the development tiles to send out your merchants onto the game area. So if we were to do this right now, we have the tile that has D printed on it. So we can send out a merchant onto the D spot over here. Uh, and once we do that, this tile will get flipped over and we would put our merchant out over here. He would put it on the leftmost available slot. Uh, there are four slots for four different merchants over here, uh, but that's for a four uh, player count game. Uh, each player, regardless of player count, can only ever put out one merchant in each city. So you're basically limited to that. If you are the first player to send out a merchant, uh, there is no other cost that you need to pay. But if somebody else had a merchant out over there, so let's say for example, orange player had a merchant already uh, over there, and I'm the second player to go in, I would go to the next spot. For each other player that is already in the city I'm sending my merchant out to, I would need to pay one servant to be able to do that. So. In this case, I would pay one servant because there is one uh, merchant already there. If somebody, if the pink player also had a merchant over there and I'm the third player to go in, I am spending, of course, two servants to be able to do that. Uh, so that's you putting out your merchant on the different spots. Now, once you do that, you now immediately start gaining benefits based on the benefit from the city itself. But you also gain benefits from cities that are connected uh, that you have merchants on that are connected to the city you just put your audio merchant on. So in this example, because we'll say that you know, everybody has just one merchant over here, uh, you would basically gain this uh, benefit immediately. So this one says you would gain three points and you get to draw a card. So that's easy enough. And this is if you only have this guy over here and nobody else out on the board. But let's say we were maybe a few turns into it and let's say we had a merchant out over here, a merchant out over here, another one perhaps out somewhere here so we have one two three four merchants out and we just put out this guy over here on this spot so if we had just done this we obviously get this bonus right over here but this is connected to this city and we have a merchant there which is connected to this city and we have a merchant there uh, we also have a merchant here, but that is not connected to this directly. It is connected indirectly, and we do not have a merchant over here. So what will basically happen is we definitely get this benefit, but we also get the benefit from these two locations. So this one would give us two points. This one would give us a coin, and you would gain that. So obviously, as you can see, as you develop your network, and you have more merchants out in the cities that are connected to one another, you just trigger benefits left, right, and center at that point, right? So on a future turn, for example, if I were to send out my merchant over here, this guy will now obviously gain the benefit from this particular token, uh, but he would now trigger benefits uh, from this one because it's connected and I have a guy over here. From this one, again connected, I have a guy over here, but also this one and this one because I have merchants over there and they are connected to this city over here uh, through merchants that I have got placed out. So as your network becomes larger, you will trigger larger and larger bonuses at that particular point in time. Uh, so that's that. Now, some of these development tiles will give you options to choose from. So the one that we had a look at basically just said D. So you're putting out a, <coughs> excuse me, 
a merchant in D itself. Others will give you flexibility. So this one says you can put out a merchant in either A, D, or E. So A, D, or E. So you can choose one of these three and you can put out a merchant over there. So that gives you a little bit of flexibilities. So you, you're gonna have a mix of the flexibility you get and the, uh, the strength of the bonus that you get from the development tile itself. Once you've uh, uh, done that, that's basically gonna be the end of your turn over there. Now, as soon as you've done that, if by any chance you have put out your merchant on uh, all of the cities of a specific color or all of the cities in a specific region, you will gain the bonus for that immediately as well. So if I, when I put this one out over here, let's say for example, if I already had uh, one of my merchants on all of the yellow spots and this was the last one that was missing and I just put that out so I have a merchant in all of the yellow cities out on the game board, I would pick up this one over here. Now, of course, only the first player to do that gets it. Uh, everybody else who does it subsequently does not get it. Uh, this will basically get you points at the end of the game. So as you can see, yellow can be quite powerful. Uh, they get you 20 points, uh, but they're, of course, much more difficult to build towards as well because they're more yellow out on the board. Other cities will give you fewer points. So blue, for example, is going to give you five points only. But as you can see, there are fewer blue locations out over there. So it's easier for you to sort of like go for that one as opposed to the yellow. Uh, but there's a motivation for you to perhaps try and do that as well, because in addition to picking these up, any time you pick out a bonus style, uh, be it one of these or one of these, you will pick up the topmost available bonus style from here as well. And of course, as we had seen earlier, uh, the higher value ones are at the very top, lower values one other are at the very bottom. So there's a combination of incentives for you to either go for bigger bonuses that might take longer, so you're gonna be slower to get to that one, or smaller bonuses, which you will get faster, and perhaps you can get to that one faster as well. The other bonus style, the reward style that you can pick up on your turn, is if you've put out a merchant on all the different cities in any one of these particular regions. And if you're the first player to do that, you basically pick up one of these regional bonus styles. And again, this is gonna be end game bonuses that you will add up. Uh, again, as soon as you do that, you also pick up uh, the top available reward bonus from over there as well. Now, with that action explained, uh, let's have a look at the fourth action, main action that you can do on your turn. And the fourth action is somewhat similar to this one. So in this one, basically what you're doing is uh, you will move the queen and you will pay with cards that match the uh, council members that are on the queen's board, which is basically the sideboard over here, uh, to basically build or put out a merchant on a particular location. So if I wanted to put out a merchant, let's say, for example, I did not have a merchant over here, but I wanted to put out a merchant over there, I can move this queen over to this location. I would pay two money, so basically paying two coins for each movement of the queen, which is basically denoted by this symbol over here. And then you're still discarding cards using the same formula that we spoke about earlier. But this time you're trying to match it to this board as opposed to the region that you're building it out in. So if I wanted to do there, I'm not going to be looking at these. I'm going to be looking at this one and I'm going to discard three purple cards and one green card in doing so. Again, if you're missing any specific colors combination, you can always pay using this particular formula over here at the bottom. It works pretty much the same way. And you would put out your merchant over there and all your bonuses would trigger pretty much the same way uh, again when you're doing that particular action. Uh, you can move your queen additional spaces as well. So maybe if I, you know, was over here and I wanted to build over there, that's one space, two space. Uh, I would pay two coins for each space I'm moving the queen. So I would pay four coins for that. And then the regular cost of the cards to be able to take that action and then put a merchant out there and then take the associated benefits on that. To do that, you do not obviously need a development tile and you don't want to worry about the cost based on this. You only worry about the cost based on this one over here. So now with the main actions explained, let's have a look at what the quick actions could look like. And the quick actions uh, can give you sort of like bonuses uh, as well on your turn or allow you to do certain things on your turn as well. Uh, the first one is basically, and you have four options that you're choosing from. So again, you do one out of these four and you do one out of these four. So the first quick action you can do is you can spend three coin. So you would basically move down three on that track over there and you would gain a servant from the supply. So that's easy enough, pay three money, get a servant. Uh, the next action that you can do is you can 
spend a servant token and you can refresh the development tiles out on that area over there so you could if let's say for example you wanted to build in a particular region uh, but you didn't you, you either weren't getting the development tiles you need to be able to do that or maybe you just want tiles that give you a different bonus whatever the reason might be you can spend a servant token so this would go back into the supply you would take the two face up available tiles from there uh, flip it face down put it to the bottom of the draw pile and you will draw two new ones out. Uh, the rulebook doesn't really give you the flexibility to say you can do that uh, for up to two tiles. Uh, you're basically refreshing both of them. So you can't keep one and refresh the other. Uh, that is not an option as per the description of the rule itself. So that's the second bonus action over here. The third bonus action is you can spend a servant and you can do the same action that's similar to this without getting the money basically. So you can spend a servant, you can pick one of the a council members up so maybe somebody wants to bring the blue back into action you're gonna slot it over from the left the rightmost one basically goes back into the general supply and that's your action uh, the only difference between this one and this one is in this one you get four money and this one you don't get any money and of course you're spending a servant to do that so it's a lesser version of this action over here the last one is actually quite powerful though uh, the last one basically says that you can spend three servants to do a main action and again uh, that that is a pretty powerful action so you can spend three servants and basically do a main action and the main action can any be any one of these four including an action that you've just taken so it would allow you to potentially take two actions uh, main actions back to back if you can afford to pay the cost for the uh, quick action over here uh, yeah and that's it that's it that's pretty much the four main actions and the four quick actions and you're doing one from each of these on your turn after you've done your uh, draw card action so you're going through those two steps as it were. A uh, couple of quick things I'll point out before we talk about the end game uh, is the nobility track. So basically whenever you see this symbol, this represents the nobility track and whenever you get this symbol it means you're moving one up on that. And whenever you move up one up on that you would see that some of these have bonuses printed at certain steps on the track. You would gain those bonuses immediately. Uh, some will give you money, some will give you, uh, 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 so this one gives you a main action, this one gives you money and points, this one gives you points and the ability to draw a card, this, this one basically allows you to basic, uh, take a development tile uh, from the play area, uh, something will get you servant and points, uh, some will allow you to activate particular locations that you have a merchant on, uh, but they will give you the restriction to say, hey, you can act to the activation, but you cannot activate a spot that gives you another movement up on the nobility track. So these uh, are described quite well at the back of the rule book. So I'm going to leave it uh, for you guys to discover that in terms of all the different symbols over there. Uh, but once you look at it and if you've understood the rules so far, uh, hopefully you can figure that out pretty easily on your own. Shouldn't I don't believe that should be a problem. Uh, the very topmost ones, of course, give you points straight up. And being higher on the track also scores you point at the end of the game, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, but with that said, those are the different actions that you can do on your turn. Uh, and this will continue going around the table until somebody's put out their 10th merchant. So as soon as somebody puts out their 10th merchant, that signals the end of the game. That player will complete their turn and everybody else gets one more turn. Uh, to do an, uh, to do basically do their actions. And at the end of that, basically, we th then start tabulating all the different points uh, from the game itself. The way that endgame points will work is, uh, obviously you would be earning points as you're going through the different uh, actions. So you're earning points over the course of the game itself. Uh, the first player uh, to put out all their 10 merchants uh, will basically gain three points uh, as uh, bonus points. If somebody else does it on their turn subsequently, uh, they would not get the three bonus points on their turn. So that's uh, an added incentive uh, for you to trigger the end game for yourself. Uh, once you've added the three points for the player who does that, uh, each player will earn the VPs from the reward tiles. So uh, the tiles that you have collected over the course of the game, these ones, you'd now add up the points for these. Uh, these points are not added in between the game. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so you'll add up the points for those. Uh, the player that is furthest up on the nobility track will earn 5 VP. And the player that is second on the nobility track will earn 2 VP. Uh, ties are somewhat friendly. So if you have two players tied for the first place, they both get 5 VP each. 
but there is no points given out for the second position. Uh, if you have two players tied for the second position, they both get two VP each. So it is uh, somewhat friendly from that point of view. Uh, and then the player that has the most business permit tiles receives three VP uh, as well. So business permits, each one of these is going to be worth points uh, as well. If you have the most of them, that is. If you have the most of it, you get three VP. Everybody else uh, does not get anything on that one. And then uh, add up all the points discussed so far. And then whoever has the most points at this stage is the winner for the game. Uh, if you do have a tie for points after all of these are added up, you will look at who has the most servants and politics cards. Uh, whoever has the most of those combined together is then the winner, and that is the tiebreaker. Um, so that's it. Those are the rules for uh, the game of Council of Four. It is a pretty fun and exciting game, so if you guys do have a copy I heavily encourage, and you haven't tried it out, I strongly encourage that you do that. Uh, and if you haven't played it, but you know somebody's putting it out on the table and you have a chance to uh, grab a seat, I strongly recommend that you take that up as well. It's uh, quite a bit underrated uh, in terms of what I've seen from other players. Now, the rules that I covered will cover you for uh, three and four player games. There is one minor setup difference if you're playing a two player game, and I just simply want to run that through right now. So the way that that will work is, uh, if you're playing a two player game, you will basically have all of this done. So you'll do all the same steps that we spoke about in setup. The one additional step that you will do is you will seed these locations with neutral player merchants, just so that you balance out the cost of putting your merchants out at the very start of the game. The way that you will do that is for each of these three, you will draw the topmost card. You will look at the different locations printed up top and you will put out uh, player pieces for a color that's not in the game. Uh, so in this case, we have B and C. So we would look at B and C, and we would put out two merchants of a color that we're not using. So that will just basically adjust the cost of entry uh, for the two players in that two player game. Uh, obviously, there are some tiles that might have just one location number, a location letter. Other tiles might have two, others might have uh, as much as three as well. So because you're doing it for all three of these regions, uh, you could have anywhere between three to nine uh, neutral player uh, merchant pieces out in the game board at the start. So it adds a little bit of variability to the game and also makes sure that uh, the cost of entry is a little bit adjusted for the fact that it's just a two player game uh, on that one. So those, that's the adjustment that you're doing for a two player game. Other than that, the rest of the rules work pretty much the same way. Uh, and that's it. That's the rules for the game. Hopefully you guys uh, found the teach useful uh, and this helps you get the game to the table a little bit faster. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna be putting out a lot more tutorials and reviews on my channels pretty soon. So if this is something that's of interest to you, do subscribe to the channel because uh, they're gonna be coming up pretty soon and hopefully you can catch them yourself as well. In the meanwhile, if you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, feel free to leave them down below. And thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take care.